Kids can make their way to Children's Church if they haven't uh, already, if some are still around in here. They can head down there. Yeah, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what to do. Today's text, it's we're in the one another's. This is pray with one another. And I'll be honest, it, it concerns me a little bit that it's another Sunday. And you know what happens after Sunday? Monday. So far, anyway, I mean, just by example, that seems to what's happened. And we show up here, and then we, we go home, and <clears throat> we rate the Sunday, and then we forget, and we're on to the next one. For many of us, it is another Sunday. But today's different. Today's the highest of priorities. Today is the subject of prayer, the very core of who we are. In fact, kind of the barometer of who we are. I've been to so many conferences on church growth and read books on it, and it seems as though the goal is grow. And somebody said the other day to me, he says, I think you're just trying to make this a mega church. And I'm not even sure what that means, but I will tell you there's a target. The target is every local church body should be growing numerically, financially, spiritually, organizationally. Every church body should be growing There's no special value on any size. Some of the greatest fellowships in the world are 10 people. Others are thousands. They're different. It's the focus on Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. And yes, our desire is to see many people come to know Christ. We should never be satisfied unless many people are coming to know Christ. But here's the trick then is then we end up wanting to do certain things to produce that kind of growth. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not doing certain things so like it's check these boxes and God's going to do this. No, you and I are hopelessly lost in our sin until Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice and all who believe in him are brought into communion with God. We spend time and pray, have a vibrant prayer life, alone, privately, and with others, because that's what salvation is. Sin has been removed, and I've brought into communion with God. Why? Because he's God. That's it. If my life falls apart, in the world's eyes, it just falls apart. It doesn't matter. That's not why we're spending time with prayer, in prayer. That's not why we love our Lord Jesus Christ so that our life is better. We love Jesus Christ, and we fall in love with our Heavenly Father, and we commune with Him in prayer because He deserves it. Oh, but that's like a secret to church growth. Now, I don't want a secret. There's no secrets. He's called us as a family to join together and to grow in our relationship with Him, regardless of what that means to a church body. And so our subject today, it's, it's kind of a heavy one, and the subject is prayer. There's 34 one another's in the Bible. 22 positive, and there's 12 negative. One of them is that we pray with one another. If you have your Bible, you could look in the book of James. If you look at James chapter 5, James 5.13 says, If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. If anyone among you is sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another 
and pray for one another that you will be healed. As we look in this topic of prayer, I want to build a few quick thoughts. Honestly, I don't even know it's going to take that long. Isn't that good to hear? Don't you love it when a preacher says it's not going to take that long? It's not true, but at least it gives you some false hope for just a minute. The Bible, of course, has a tremendous emphasis on prayer. The Bible, we know this, right? Jesus, in all of his authority, expected us to pray. Matthew 6, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon, 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, in the middle of it, he says three times, and when you pray, and when you pray, and he gives instruction, and when you pray, it was a given that there is a spirit of prayer. Luke 11 has a redundancy, ask, seek, knock. Christ in Luke 18 told his disciples that you should always pray. Paul said, devote yourselves to prayer. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Now, let's define for a second. We're not necessarily talking about intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is your prayer list that many of you keep. It's certain things that you're always praying for. That's praying for things. That's a type of prayer. Prayer overall is a sense of communion with God. There's a great author that said, the more I prayed, the more I realized that prayer isn't speaking, it's listening. Because we sit with a Bible passage, and we just think about it, and we're in communion with God. That's what prayer is, communion with God. It involves praying for certain things. It involves confession of sin. It involves praise. Yeah, all of those things. But at the very core, it's living in a communion with God. That's how it is that we could pray without ceasing. Because we're always in this communion. So you take a passage like John 3.16, and you think about it. God so of the world, he gave his one and only son. Lord, you're amazing. You did that for me. This is prayer. And we read it, and we listen to it. And we allow those words that are alive, it's God's Word, working in our heart. That's prayer. And the Bible is over and over and over the value of prayer. This is kind of a long line. It's Simon Kahn wrote this amazing book, Spiritual Theology. He said this, if Christians know what it means, if they really know what it means, pray without ceasing. <clears throat> excuse me, or be constant in prayer, or pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication, or in Colossians, continue steadfastly in prayer. Always pray and don't faint. Is this getting redundant? He said, if we really knew what all that was, then all aspects of our life would be redeemed redeemed, brought back into that relationship with God that we were originally meant for, that sin ruined. <clears throat> if only we would learn and grow in the discipline of this communion with God in which we just sit and listen to His Word, and yes, there's a place for the prayer request because you have a list of them. I do too. Yeah, that's next. I want to be in communion with him, and I want to listen to his word and allow his words to penetrate my heart and my soul, and then I want to walk throughout the day in that communion. That's prayer. That's what we're called to. This is salvation. Because at death, the only thing that changes at death is that we are doing that by faith, and then at death we transfer and we do it by sight. It's communion with God. He fulfills us. He brings us the contentment. Any of us old enough in the computer business that you remember defragging? Do you guys remember that? It was fun to watch, wasn't it? It goes around and it fills in all the spots. I don't even know what it meant. I could watch it for hours, though. 
That's what prayer does. Prayer is redeeming us, and it's going through our life and filling in those missing pieces and correcting those pieces that were trained in you wrong as a child. Parents did the best they could. Many of them didn't, but some of them did, and that's nice. That's very good. Thank you, but I am not fulfilled in my family. I'm not fulfilled in relationships or job. You and I are fulfilled and redeemed through a growing, healthy, vibrant relationship with God. Huh? I can see you're getting excited, so calm down, relax, it's okay. That's what prayer is. People say, oh, I'll read your Bible every day. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, yes, but could you read your Bible every day and have it not redeem you? Yes, you can. Because you read it and it stays right here. And you're like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what he meant by that. Wow, that's great. I'm going to work now. No, it's prayer. We read the text and we allow it to soak through our head and into our heart and our life, and He redeems us. He changes us. It's a life of prayer. It's literally living and praying without ceasing. We know this. I don't think I'm saying anything new, am I? Maybe saying it in a way that you've maybe not heard it, whatever. We're reminding ourselves of this. But it's so challenging because it's private. That's the problem. Service isn't. I can serve somewhere and everyone sees me. And I can say, oh, no, not me. Glory to the Lord. And there's a mirror on the ceiling. I'm pointing. It's me. I mean, that service and doing things, we, we get the attention. But prayer is private. I was listening to sports radio some time back because <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm such a jock. And um, <laughs> I don't know, it was uh, Arizona Cardinals uh, talk about how they lose so many games. And these two jocks are talking, and all of a sudden, one of them said this, and I I couldn't believe he said it. It was so good. We're talking about a player, and he got in trouble. That's I mean, it was like we read this all the time, but it was a football player, got himself into some trouble, uh, domestic something. I don't know exactly what it was, and this is what the one jock said on the air to the other jock. He says, I don't ever really know a man What he is like during the day can be faked, but what that man is at 11 o'clock at night alone, that's who he is. I'm like, did he just say that? How does he know that? During the day is what we put on. What you're like in the middle of the night when you're alone, that's who you are. It's private prayer. So that's the frustration today is that we talk about it. And again, I don't think I'm saying anything new. I'm just just simply laying it out for us. And we finish and we go, hmm, that was really good. We go and have lunch, take care of business around the house and whatever you're doing with sports and all the stuff going on. And then the next thing we know, we're just looking forward to seeing and wonder what the topic is next week. Well, you know what? Maybe this topic should be every week. Maybe we take the next 15 weeks and we do nothing but this subject and and we leave no man behind. And we just take off the mitts and we say, I'm just going to ask you directly, what is your prayer life like? Because I can learn from your prayer life and I need it. So I'm going to learn from you, you're going to learn from me, and we're all going to, as a community, learn what it means to practice, as Brother Lawrence would say, practice the presence of God in a communion of prayer regularly, so much that it's so disciplined within us that ultimately we end up, that ultimately we just end up living that way all day long. 
Scoot way back in the slides, if you would. That was Bible emphasizes prayer. The second one is great Christians emphasize prayer. Well, these could go on forever. It's just, and these aren't, these aren't looking at a book on great quotes on prayer. These are books that I've read and I've looked at and I've seen in the context of which they're written. You know who William Carey is? I learned something about William Carey this week. He's one of the great missionaries. He's English, great missionary to India. He started the first university in all of India that provides credit for your classes. This is 18th century. This is what he said. Prayer. Secret, fervent, believing prayer lies at the root of all personal godliness. This is a guy who's historically did it. I mean, he, he brought the gospel to India. This is William Carey. It's not the Bible. But according to a guy who lived it, he said, Prayer, secret, fervent, believing prayer lies at the root of all personal godliness, which tells me if prayer, the discipline of a fervent prayer life within you and within your life is not there, actually I'll explain what it is. I know it from personal experience, and I know it from years of ministry. When it's not there, when it's not a vibrant prayer life in this passionate relationship with our Heavenly Father through faith in Jesus where we sit and we just enjoy the redeeming power of this relationship, when it's not there, the power is gone for daily living godliness, and so what we end up doing is following rules and kicking ourselves or breaking more rules and having sin in our life, and we shouldn't, and so we struggle with not having it. It's called sin management. A Christian who has a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ that resorts to a defeated life of sin management and wonders why it's not real. I prayed and received Jesus. Yeah, that was the door that got you into the relationship with God, and it's enjoying that freedom and that relationship with God's Word, allowing to sink into our heart and mind and allow it to work in our heart and our life, and we watch the sin disappear. The desire for those things that you shouldn't desire disappear. Not because you saw the rule and are following it. It's because you're in a vibrant relationship with God. That's William Carey. John Wesley. God does nothing but an answer to prayer. I don't know if I mentioned uh, our mentor, pastor in our life, Don Ingram. When he retired, I led this event for him, and I was able to sit with him and find out people that he's known and done ministry with. So we're just chatting names. <clears throat> Turned out he just knew about everyone. Then I started naming names as a joke. So, like, I asked if he knew um, Mother Teresa, which I thought was a funny question. And he, he's like, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, did you date her? And he goes, I didn't date her, but yes, I've spent time with Mother Teresa. Is that hilarious? So, but my mentor pastor, a little bit more like me, he's met her on many occasions, and, and he says, when it's on her turf, the thing he mentioned most obvious were her, her feet because she never wore shoes. And he goes, when you don't wear shoes, your feet just kind of seem to get bigger. And he, he mentioned that her feet were kind of like paddles. And I'm like, well, that's really a spiritual observation. <laughs> that was really nice to hear. I'm glad you're actually human. There was a young priest that asked Mother Teresa, young priest, that simply said, I don't know what to do. What what do you do? How How do I do ministry? My life is committed. And in her meek spirit, she said, pray an hour a day, just in a communion, uninterrupted with God, an hour a day, and then you'll be fine. Do you see the principle there? 
I don't know what to do with. We have questions galore about life and Christian living, and they're all so unique with all of us. What do we do? Well, the root of it all, live in a communion with God in prayer. Have that a part of the private prayer life. Have that. Then let's talk. But we hear, yeah, I I know that, but I'm asking, go back. Jonathan Edwards, when God has something very great to accomplish for his church, it will be that it will always be preceded by extraordinary prayers of his people. So I think this is what we get caught up in. We get caught up in, what's the old phrase, Uh, rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. If only we could, and this is our worship team that does really, for what we have resource-wise, they're doing a great job. And they themselves, yeah, but if we could just get to, yeah, I, I hear you. I want those same goals. If we could just get a youth department, if we could just, I, I'm with you on all of that. That's not the answer, though. That's not the answer. When men and women who are called by his name would humble themselves and pray and seek God's face. Then we hear from heaven. Am I right? How do we get past that? How do we say, yes, I believe that, and then we're off onto the same thing, rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic? No, I want... I want increased vibrancy of prayer life, don't you? No, I'm not going to be the spiritual great giant. It was Charles Finney that said, if given two hours before I preach, I was told two hours, he goes, I will take an hour of it of just prayer and then an hour of preparation. I'm like, yeah, yeah, how many of us can last an hour and still be awake? Right? I mean, let's be honest. It's okay. What it is, is it's practicing that presence of God. We take that text and we listen and we enjoy that communion with God and allow His Word to filter into our hearts and our minds. And and we get up and we try to live in that spirit of that communion. But we only last 10 minutes. Oh, Do it, though. Keep doing it. It won't be long, it'll last 15 minutes. You keep doing that, it won't be long before it's lasting an hour. It's exactly like learning to run a long distance. Me, a long distance, would be running back to my Bible notes right here, and I'm going to pant. But if I do that enough, it won't be long I could run to that back door. If I keep doing that, I'm going to be able to run around the building. If I keep doing that, that's what everyone who's ever run a marathon has done. They keep extending it and extending it. We have a friend that does those 100-mile races. That's crazy. I can't drive 100 miles without stopping. It's the same principle. You and I have to be so committed to the principle of prayer Prayer is communion with God. It is what we were saved for. Not for heaven someday, although that's included. We're saved for relationship with God. That's faith in Jesus Christ. And we enjoy that communion. And depending on how spiritually strong we are, we can pull it off for this long. But keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. And before we know it, we're walking in communion with God and praying without ceasing. For so many years, I have these little strips of paper. They're still everywhere. They're a little pack of them with a clip. They're in my car. They're in the motorcycle bag. They're at the office. They're at my desk at my home office. They're everywhere. And I'll write a phrase from the devotional reading. Like, for God so loved the world. That'd be enough. 
and I'll write it. And commune with God on that one phrase. And then I unclip it and stick it in my pocket. Because it's not 20 minutes later if somebody says, hey, what'd you read this morning? And I go, oh, I know, um, the Bible. They go, no, 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 like where exactly? I don't know, I don't remember. Am I right? I mean, it's just, I feel it. I go grab my keys and the piece of paper's there. And I go, oh, that's right. Oh, for God's sake. And I reacquaint myself with that communion of prayer to do every trick and everything I can to get my mind to keep going back, going back into that spirit of prayer. So here's what we have. I have, I have five things, and I'm just going to mention them. They are in your notes, but if you take a look at a bulletin, they are also on the tab in the bulletin because we need some help. We need some prayer support here. And so if you see that little tab inside the bulletin, it's got the five categories. And what I'm going to ask is we're just going to look over these. If there's one of these that you're wanting to participate in, just check it. Check it and leave it on the church pew, and we'll grab it later. So let's think of those for a minute. The first one is private prayer. Private prayer. Will you increase private prayer this week? That's the simple question. And for some of us, this is good news, if it's increasing it, last week may have been so bad that just by you thinking of doing it, you're a step ahead. This is good news. You know, it's not, you don't have to be the spiritual giant. Can you increase the time in private prayer? Take a passage of Scripture and read it and stop and think and commune with God over that text. The, there's still copies out here of Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. Each day is built on a little phrase of the Bible. It's perfect for that. And so grab one if you don't have one or if you've misplaced it, grab one. If you're visiting with us, grab one. They're in the lobby. It's private prayer. The second area of prayer that we have as a church is the prayer chain. It's a great opportunity to find a kind of in time, real life, this is prayer requests coming through email. And if that's something that you would be interested in being on, if you're not, give us your email address and we'll add you to that distribution. Tuesdays, 9 a.m., Kathy's group. Where's Kathy? Is she downstairs? Oh, there you are. Good. Kathy leads a prayer group. And there's some guys splattered in there too. It's mostly ladies, but there's some guys in there. And it's pretty good time. And if you want to drop in on that, even just for some Tuesday to see what it's like, I'd encourage you to do that. Maybe you could check that. Here are the two areas that are urgent. We do a lot on Sunday mornings. In fact, what happens on Sunday mornings is kind of like a, um, uh, a bill going through Congress or a budget going through Congress. It has its central purpose, but then you know how everyone adds to it in Congress? They get their pet projects just to get it through. We get, we get forgetting what Sunday mornings are about. It's the one time we all gather, so I get it. We all gather together, and we have so many things we want to accomplish in this one-hour period of time. What we're doing is getting on the very basics of what we're about. We're about worshiping God and listening to His Word, right? I mean, that's Sunday morning. Should be bathed in prayer. So the two time slots, these bottom two of the five, the first one is before the service. In a conference room over there somewhere, that we have a group of people that will get together and pray through the service. We have teachers right now downstairs. Are they not the greatest, John? That's your team down there. They're remarkable. Teaching the Word. We need to pray for them. Pray for people that are coming in that are struggling. Pray for those that are participating in the service. Commit the morning. Come in communion with God over the morning. We should have that before service on Sunday. Do you agree with me? Shouldn't we? Hey, some of you have things that are going on that hour service. That's okay. I get it. We all participate in some way. But I would tell you there's some of us who should be praying during that time. 
And one that's on my heart is after the service. That's the last one. If we offer anything on a Sunday, somebody that comes in struggling, don't we want to offer them prayer? I mean, if they're not getting it here, where are they going to get it? To offer it. We should have a little team that has a little bit of training, a little bit of training maybe, always available after the service, off to the side, that anybody, all of us, at various times get to go over and pray with. Wouldn't you say that's what we should do? <laughs> Not asking for much. It's the very core of who we are. Okay, I went long. This is terrible. I told you we were going to be short, didn't I? We are short because I thought we were going to go to 1215. And based on my mind, I thought 1215, this is short. Okay, I'm going to read one thing and then we're done. Why is it we don't pray more? Just give me reasons. Not for yourself, but why don't we have a more vibrant prayer life? What's that? Caught up with work. Excellent. Non made a priority. Thank you for sharing that. Too busy. Don't know how to do it. Ah, excellent. Things are going pretty good the way they are. So the need isn't there. Felt need. Anybody else? Other reasons? What's that? Just kind of dropped out of it. What was that? What is it? Control. Oh, control. Don't want to act like we're dependent. So when we stand together, I'm going to read. While we're standing together, John's going to make his way up. This quote drives me crazy, and I thought the best way for me to handle it is to make it drive you crazy. <laughs> All right? One of the great spiritualists of the 1800s is a guy named William Law. His book, Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, is unbelievable. Listen how simple this is, and maybe it's convicting to you as well. He said, you see two persons. One is regular in public and private prayer, and the other is not. Now, the reason for this difference is not this, that one has strength and power to observe prayer and the other has not, but the reason is this that one intends to please God in the duties of devotion and the other has no intention. Why don't I pray more? Because I don't want to. Does that hurt? That's why. I'll do everything in my day that I want to do. If I don't, I'm going to get it in tomorrow for sure. We don't pray more because we don't want to. And so for some of us in this room, it's simply beginning with, God, put in me the desire. I am so much of a sinner that I can't even desire prayer on my own. I'd rather watch Netflix. You give me two choices, vibrant prayer or binge, Netflix. Oh, there are times I'm going to pick Netflix. I'm not fighting it. I've got to say, God, put within me that desire. If you checked one of those boxes or whichever ones you checked, if you would perforate that and just lay it on the church pew, leave it there, we'll collect it. We need to get moving. There's areas of prayer we need to start fostering within the church. You agree with me, right? Would love for you to be a part of that as we rally around our communion with God. Heavenly Father, as now we sing together and reflect on these words, I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would produce within us an increased desire to pray. Give us that motivation, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.